From now on, everybody agrees to it. Am I the Welcome back, physics fans. Am I the first one to do this? Okay, no pressure, huh? No pressure whatsoever. Okay, so today we have Mihailo Bakovic, who is currently at CP3 in Louvain, Belgium, a very prestigious institution, and was a postdoc at Weizmann Institution in Israel for three years. Before that, he graduated from a very distinguished University of Kansas in 2011 under the supervision of some of the people in this room. <laughs> and today he will tell you about strategies for new physics searches at LHC Run 2. Thank you, John. Um, so let me say just that uh, it's actually very bizarre for me to stand on this side of the room. I've, stand, I've sat on that side of the room many times in the course of the six years that I spent here. And uh, the fact that I actually get to, uh, get to be here for once is uh, both uh, very exciting, very honoring, but uh, very, very weird and scary at the same time, I gotta say. Um, this is my first colloquium also, so it's very special and, and I'm very honored to actually be able to give it right here where my physics career um, you know, really started. So I want to tell you about basically some of the things that I kind of uh, started noticing about the way we look for new physics at the LHC and some of the conclusions that I came up with about uh, uh, sort of intuitively what we should do for the upcoming run two of the LHC. Uh, a lot of the work that I will tell you about, I, I, I did actually while I was at uh, uh, Weizmann, and uh, uh, a lot of the work was done in, in collaboration with uh, Tom Flake, uh, Yonghan Kim, and Sang Lee from uh, KAIST in Korea, and then uh, Gilad Perez from uh, uh, Weizmann, who was my, my uh, uh, advisor mentor there. So um, let's begin with sort of a short intro of, uh, of where we are. Um, it's, a, it's supposed to say LHC past and future, but uh, I guess we can't lower it, so uh, you know, interpolate. Um, so we, we built this magnificent machine, and we finished uh, running it at 7 and 8 and 8 PV, and uh, basically this was really a technological and, and, and scientific spectacle in, uh, in, in every possible way. Okay, so why I, why I say this from the technological side, we really have a proof of principle that we're able to build this colossal machine and make it work. I mean, the humankind has never undertaken a project of this size, ever, okay? Uh, we developed many, many sort of side technologies uh, that, that uh, are even uh, applicable in uh, modern day uh, uh, industry and so on. So for instance, uh, er, last year I was visiting uh, CERN and, and people were essentially saying that superconductor magnet, magnet research is basically being driven by the demand from the LHC. Okay, it's like the, the, the really the only place which needs uh, magnets of, uh, of that performance right now. Also, the, the data processing and transfer uh, technologies that, that were developed for the LHC was something that was almost unprecedented uh, before. And uh, then I put some doubts because these are the only three things that I could think of at the, <laughs> at the moment. But here, just to, to sort of, if you're not familiar with the LHC, like when I see a picture like this, this is to me even now this is completely amazing. I mean, this is a, a collision from uh, CMS, and uh, I believe this might be uh, one of the nuclear collisions uh, by the the amount of stuff that's in there. But you see that the like the amount of stuff that we are able to collect, record with this kind of frequency is just staggering. I mean, this is to me uh, today completely amazing. On the physics side, uh, some very exciting things happened as well. So uh, the first one of which, uh, uh, and the one that most people are very familiar with, is of course the discovery of the Brat and Glerk Higgs boson, and I have to call it that because now I live in Belgium. Um, <laughs> the other thing that we, we discovered was that the standard model is actually a very good theory, okay? Surprisingly enough, it, uh, it, it, it works quite well, and uh, uh, this, this might be strange, it might not be strange, but it is the way it is, okay, and it's, uh, it's exciting. In the process of, uh, of discovering these two facts, we managed not to destroy the world, and this is a big scientific uh, uh, discovery, 
And the last one that I put here, a lot of people will find this as a complete disaster, but to me, this is actually a big accomplishment, and this is that we actually managed to rule out most of the minimal supersymmetric models, okay? To me, this is scientific progress because uh, uh, one would hope that people would actually move on and do some other things, okay? <laughs> Unfortunately, this has not happened, but uh, I will still put this as a big accomplishment of the other three. All right, so what, I, what is ahead of us? Um, so the, the, the run two of the LHC at uh, 13 plus TeV, it's actually not clear at, uh, uh, what's gonna be the final energy yet, but that's why, that's why I put the plus. This has already begun, the beams are already running. Um, and uh, uh, if you're wondering how much energy is a 13 plus TeV, what you should think about is a couple of TGV trains uh, uh, running about 150 kilometers per hour. Or if you're into blowing up stuff, this is equivalent to about 100 kilograms of uh, dynamite exploding, okay? Um, the data collection will begin in uh, spring 2015, which is essentially in uh, only a in a couple months. Uh, and uh, we should expect first physics results. This is the really exciting part by the late summer of 2015. Uh, what's clear at the moment is that they, they're planning on accumulating about 10 inverse femtobarns of data uh, by the end of the year. How things will go from there, you should ask someone who has insider information uh, in the room. Uh, from what I can tell, the, the I'm getting conflicting information, okay? Um, and uh, just here, uh, as a comment, if you don't know what an inverse femtobarn is, uh, it's essentially a unit of, of the amount of data. So it's a measure of the total number of collisions that were recorded. Okay, but think of it as the, the, the amount of data. And I will give you a better estimate of, of how much 10 uh, femtobarns is uh, in a moment. So far, uh, the, the current run has, has collected, well, it's really about 25 uh, here instead of 20. Uh, 25 inverse femtobarns a day. So in the, in the entire LHC history, we've so far collected 25 inverse femtobarns, okay? Um, one important thing about uh, integrated luminosity or the amount of data, okay, uh, uh, which is what integrated uh, luminosity measures, uh, that's gonna be relevant for this talk is that it, it actually takes a lot of time and money to accumulate it, okay? And uh, the reason why I'm showing you this is because it tells us that, that we're essentially limited by, by the amount of time and the amount of money that we can spend collecting data. At the end of the day, we cannot collect infinite amounts of luminosity. It will be limited to something. So as an example here, see that uh, uh, when we ran the LHC at the 8 TV, it took us most of the 2012 to collect 20, uh, 25 uh, inverse phantom rounds of data, okay? Now, on the theory side, what's ahead of us? Uh, typically, people like to ask the question, like, what kind of new physics should I expect to see at the LHC? And uh, I personally don't like this question. And the reason why I don't like it is twofold. So first, um, we live in a, in a very sort of strange time, and I, I can't think of a many, many times in particle physics history when this has happened, but we really don't have I'm not gonna say any, but we have very little idea of the sort of energy scale at which new physics should appear on, okay? A perfect example for this is dark matter physics, okay? You look at the literature, people will propose dark matter models at the MEV scale, at a GV scale, at a TV scale, multi-TV, KEV, and all of these models work, all right? We really, we really know very little about where we should look for, for, for things, all right? Now, if you make, of course, extra assumption, this is then you can establish a scale, but in reality, we, we're really kind of, uh, kind of lost. The other thing is that, that in this kind of scenario, a natural outcome is that every single theorist will have about 10 models of new physics that will uh, be at different scales and all of them will work. So even after LHC uh, run one, which ruled out some of these things, we still have too many models, okay, in my opinion. And in this kind of scenario, I think, a better thing to do is to step back and instead of asking a question of what kind of new physics should I expect, we should ask a question of how should I look for new physics, okay? I think that, that we're really at the point where the bottom-up approach to, to particle physics is the, 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 the real thing that will move us forward, okay? Not models and, uh, uh, and, and sort of top-down theoretical approach. Now, um, so what does experiment tell us? 
And uh, so I stole this plot from, from uh, the Atlas collaboration. Uh, in a presentation, I find this plot mostly useless because no one can ever read anything that is written here, okay? But there is one thing that, that, uh, that, that is useful in this plot. And uh, that thing is, is this little scale here, okay? So what this is showing is, is if you assume certain kinds of physics scenarios, okay, that people have considered, and you look at the, the lower mass range of these new particles that, that are established, those are these, these bars, these colored bars. And what you see is that most of these physics scenarios that people have, have thought of are actually going into a, a lower mass range where, where the, the masses are at least one TeV, okay? One TeV is about a, a thousand protons, okay? So, so things that are a thousand times heavier than the proton, okay? So when we say, when we think of the new sort of high energy frontier of particle physics, that's really going to be the, the, the TV scale. So run two explored sort of the, the hundreds of uh, GEVs, what we call the electroweak scale, and the, the, the new uh, LHC run will really probe this, this range here, all right? Now, the caveat here is that there is, of course, always a way to hide new physics in lower mass ranges because we don't have know what the scale is and because we're very creative and smart, all right? But I don't want to talk about these kind of things. What I want to talk about is, is essentially searches for new physics at this TV scale, okay? For this talk, let's, uh, let's uh, limit ourselves to this. Now, if we want to probe the LHC, uh, the, the TV scale of the LHC run two, what we have to realize is that this comes with a new kinematic regime. And I'll explain what I mean by that in a, in a second. And then the natural questions that you might ask yourself is, is essentially, you're doing a new thing, so you have to figure out what are the best ways to, to look for new physics at the, at the TV scale. And what you actually also have to ask yourself is, do I need to reevaluate re the methodology and the approaches that I was using before, all right? Now, to sort of uh, uh, get into these questions, I want to tell you essentially what, what we do at the, at the LHC uh, experiment. So when people collide protons and they want to measure new physics or existing physics or, or whatever, uh, you really have only a few basic physics objects at your disposal, okay? So the first one that, that is very popular is leptons. So by this I mean electrons and muons, okay? And these are very nice physics objects, especially muons, because if you look at the, uh, how, how muon looks in a detector, it basically comes out of uh, uh, a collision and it leaves this very nice, long, well-defined track, okay? And this track can be measured to very high precision. You can extract uh, uh, the information about this muon to, to, to a very, very high degree, okay? Uh, electrons are, are uh, not as nice as muons, but still nice enough to be uh, in the same category. There are these red lines here, okay? Then what you can measure is the missing energy, okay? And these are things that essentially don't interact with the, with the matter in the detector. So like, if you produce the neutrino here, it would just fly out, okay? Or if you're lucky enough, then you produce dark matter, for instance, it would do the same thing. So what you see this is essentially, you would collect the, all the energy that you record in, the, in the, these calorimeters, and you would see that there's something missing, okay? And the resolution of this is actually pretty good as well. And the third things that I actually like a lot, uh, but uh, uh, some people don't, are jets. And I put here dirty, uh, and I, I mean this in a way, uh, I have to explain to you what I mean by this, right? So uh, if you look at how we measure jets, is basically uh, jets, are, jets are gluons and, and light quarks, okay? That then leave a shower of particles in the, in the well, electromagnetic partly and the, partly in the, or here, yeah, electromagnetic and partly in the hadronic calorimeter. So what you see when you measure, when you want to observe a quark or a gluon, what you really see is just a spray of particles. This is what we call a jet, all right? Now you want to try to reconstruct, uh, uh, essentially, the information out of this, this spray. So what you typically have to do is you have to develop some sort of a, a specialized clustering algorithm, okay? They will take this uh, the spray of particle and it will sum it up according to some rule and uh, and give you essentially one form of momentum which you hope will uh, approximate well an underlying uh, uh, 
gluon or a quark or a pion or whatever you, your uh, uh, frame to measure, right? So the way, the way this is typically done is, uh, is, and this is generic to all these clustering algorithms, is you have to pick some sort of an angular scale, okay, for uh, in, um, in, in, the, in the, this plane of the detector, and then uh, this algorithm will just go around and it will cluster the, the different uh, parts of the shower until it gives you some sum of them which you hope uh, is, uh, is, is approximating well your gluon or your quark or uh, whatever, okay? And this is typically, just for the scale, this is typically, this uh, size of this cone is uh, 0.4 in this uh, uh, eta phi, okay, uh, angle. Question? Now, the bad thing about jets is that the systematic uncertainties, because you have to reconstruct this shower, are typically much larger than the leptons or, or the missing energy, because you're not dealing with one single isolated track, you're dealing with many, many, many things, it's kind of messy, okay? But over the course of the years, this has become much better. So at the Tevatron, uh, for instance, if you ask people uh, jets versus leptons, uh, leptons were infinitely better tools, okay? At the LHC, this is not really the case anymore. I mean, jet, the energy resolution of the jets is not as good as leptons, but it's, it's getting uh, uh, sort of to the same uh, ballpark. And this is important for the, for the LHC run two, and we will come to it in, uh, in a minute. So this is a very heuristic picture of jet clustering. There's a, you know, uh, one could give you entire courses on, on, on how this works, but it just gives you an uh, idea of, of what you have to do. Okay, so the conventional wisdom from, I guess, Tevatron as well, but uh, LHC run one, is that if you ask for people how, how should you look for uh, new physics at run one, what they will tell you typically is uh, you should always look at leptons because leptons are clean and I can measure them well and I can reconstruct them well and, and things like that. If you have missing energy in your event, this is very, very nice because if you, if you want to isolate new physics from standard model physics, the amount of uh, uh, missing energy you get from standard model is typically in a lot of cases uh, 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 limited compared to what you would get from some uh, heavy new physics. Um, if you can get some photons that are, that are of high energy, this is also very nice. For instance, uh, this was a very good channel to look for the Higgs uh, at, uh, at run one. But you should avoid jets as they're really messy. You have to try really hard to reconstruct this, this mess of a jet here, okay? So you should not really, if you can avoid them, you, you should do so, right? Now the question is, will the same hold for run two? And the answer is really kind of, but what I notice is that there are many things that will change, and there are many things that we can improve. Okay, so I wanna go over several uh, examples to illustrate this point. Okay, so example number one. Let's assume that we want to look for uh, new resonance. Okay, some, some heavy new particle which will uh, decay into a pair of top quarks. Okay, and this is, uh, this can be Kaluza Clark Luans, uh, Z prime, whatever. I, I don't care about which model uh, it is. All I care is that there is some, some, let's say some resonance and it decays into top. The reason why this example is good in my opinion is because top quarks are very good illustrators for this, uh, 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 how we reconstruct objects in, uh, in the LHC. And the reason is that a top quark will decay into a B quark and a W boson about 100% of the time. And now this W boson will decay into a lepton and a neutrino about 22% of the time, and about two thirds of the time it will decay into two quarks, okay? Quarks will give you jets, neutrino is missing energy, and leptons are leptons. So tops are essentially very good illustrators for all these physics objects that I showed you uh, on the previous slides with the cross-section of the detector, okay? so we can. We can have some sort of comparison of how, how well each one of them will work in certain scenarios. Okay, now let's assume that uh, this, is, this resonance is very heavy, so above a, a TV. If you look at the, the kinematics of this decay, what you find out is you just solve the, the, the kinematic equations and what you find out is that the energy essentially, I use the, the, the label PT which stands for transverse momentum, but you can really think of it as the energy that, that is carried by this, uh, by this top quark, okay? Um, so the energy that is carried by this top quark will be essentially half of the resonance mass, okay? And you see this on this plot here. So for instance, if this, uh, if this resonance G prime 
uh, is of about one TeV, the average top will fly out with about 500 GeV, okay? And then if you go to higher masses, you get some smearing because uh, you're colliding protons and not uh, point particles, and this thing has some uh, width, and so things get smeared a bit. But the point is that if you go to very high masses, okay, masses that are not really yet probed <laughs> by, by the LHC run one, what you see is that most of your top quarks that fly out will be highly energetic. You're in this regime where the energy of the top is much higher than the mass of the top, okay? So what you end up with is, is really that if you have a 2 TV resonance, you don't get any quarks below 400 GeV. And to me, this is actually kind of weird because if you think about it, merely 10 years ago when, when the Tevatron was running, people were producing top quarks close to threshold. I mean, you had to try really hard to actually reconstruct the top and to produce it and so on. And uh, uh, you know, this was sort of a, a low energy object. And 10 years later, we're producing tops that carry 400 GeV of PT. These are essentially acting as light quarks, okay? This is very, very strange to me. <coughs> now, this situation that, uh, that uh, you get a lot of essentially high energy quarks brings us to, to my first point, and that's that boosted or highly energetic uh, heavy objects will actually become very important that the LHC run to. If you want to look at heavy resonances, okay, the decay to uh, tops or Ws or Zs or so on, okay, you will have to consider these very highly energetic uh, objects. And this is related to my second point, and that's that this is both a good and a bad thing. All right. So first, why is it a, a bad thing? And basically, it's kinematic. So let's say you're interested in measuring uh, uh, some top quark which came out of a decay of a heavy particle, and it decays into a B quark and then another two light quarks. So this is essentially three jets, okay? If this top quark comes out at low energy, so very slow, quote unquote slow, okay, what you will see in the detector is essentially a three jet event which looks like this, okay? It just kind of isotropically decays. These jets are very well isolated, and so what you, you can do is you can use your traditional uh, jet uh, clustering method with this traditional cone of 0.4, and uh, and it will it will output of this procedure will be that you will see very three very well isolated jets. Okay. Now, if you go to very high energy top, what you will see is that because of the boost in one direction, the decay products will be boosted in that direction as well. So these three quarks will come out collimated. Okay. Now. Uh, if you look at the sort of scaling rule of the angular scale into which they will decay, you'll find out that it, it, is, it essentially runs as uh, two masses of the top divided by the energy of the, of the star. So to give you a, a feeling of, the, of how the scaling works, if the top runs, uh, comes out at 200 GeV, these will decay into an angular scale of 1.8. But if you have a top which comes out at 800 GeV, what you will find out is that the decay products will actually decay into an angular scale which was before enough to fit only one jet. So your entire top decay will fit here, all right? Now, why is this a problem? Well, first, the, the solution is typically to increase the cone size, all right? So instead of clustering with 0.4, you cluster everything into, into 1.0 where the entire top core can fit, all right? Now, why is this a problem? And uh, uh, the reason is essentially that we have a proton-proton collider at hand. So if you look at what this event would look like if, uh, if uh, this quark was non-boosted, these quarks were non-boosted, is you would get one, two, three, four, five, six jets in your event, and you would call this a six-jet event, all right? But if, uh, if these come out boosted and you cluster them with a the, with the bigger quark, what you come up with is two-jet events, all right? Now, the problem is that if you look at the, the processes which happen at the, at the LHC and you collide proton, the largest process by far that you get, the one that, that appears most frequently, is essentially proton, proton to two jets. It overwhelms everything else by orders of magnitude. So you have a problem now that your interesting top, top event, okay, looks like the largest standard model background that you can imagine, all right? So one thing to do 
is to look at the, the what we call the mass of this jet. All right, and here I'm uh, uh, in the red. I'm plotting essentially the the light jets, the standard model PP to uh, to JJ distribution, and you can see that it gives you something that peaks at about uh, uh, 50 GV. Okay, and if you instead produce top jets and you plot the mass, you'll find that this jet actually reproduces correctly the physical mass of the top quark on average. Okay, so you see it peak at about 175 GV, right? So then, then the basic, the most trivial thing to do is simply you impose some sort of a mass window in this plot and you only select events which fall inside this window, okay? That's the step zero. However, it turns out that this is all normalized to one at the moment, but if I normalize it to the total number of, uh, of uh, events that I will get, this would still be somewhere here, okay? Even, even this part that's in the window. So just imposing this mass cut is really not enough. So people are smart, so they thought, okay, let me look inside the jet, all right? So if you look at inside this jet, what you see is essentially the imprint that it leaves in the, in the detector it looks like some sort of a splash pattern, okay? So this is a typical high energy top uh, uh, jet. And, and this top jet displays this very characteristic three peak uh, uh, structure that you can kind of uh, observe here. And the fact that this is a splash pattern should really sort of be telling you that, that this is kind of an image processing problem, okay? You can look at the splash pattern and you can ask yourself, can I characterize this, uh, this uh, three peak uh, structure? Can I find some useful correlations inside this structure? Like the fact that uh, two of these quarks came out of a W boson and so they somehow have to reconstruct uh, the W boson. Uh, can I come up with, the, with some sort of observable which will be sensitive to the number of, of these peaks or the relative size of the peaks and so on and so on. You know, this is essentially the kind of thing that people who, who do uh, image processing are trying to come up with algorithms that will tell you whether uh, uh, there is a face on a picture or it's a printer or whatever, okay? You can, you can really use the same kind of technology but for, for particle physics. It's very, it's very interesting and fun. Um, so basically, if you, if you succeed to efficiently categorize and characterize these splash patterns, you can develop algorithms which will essentially tag these jets as, as, as tops. They will tell you some sort of likelihood that, that this is a top or that it's a W or that uh, it's a light jet or a gluon and so on, okay? And uh, over the course of the years, much work has been done on this. Uh, I myself have spent a lot of the last three years working on, on this kind of stuff. Um, I will only show you one slide here, which is a, a summary from, uh, from algorithms which CMS uh, considered. It's a bit out of date, but uh, it shows you a point. Uh, there are no error bars in these plots because these are all simulations, okay? Uh, and why am I showing you this? I want to, to, to show you essentially how much progress we've made over the years. So on the x-axis in these plots for different energy uh, tops, you see essentially uh, the, the top tagging efficiency. That means that, that uh, you, you make a cut on your observable in such a way that you keep 50, let's say, 50% 50 of the true top events, okay? Now, if let's say you pick this point of uh, 0 0.5, you see that, uh, that uh, the, uh, the, the probability that you will have out of a corresponding sample of light jets that you will, you will have a jet which is essentially uh, labeled as a top is 1%, okay? So this tells you that we've reached a level where, where for each uh, 50 tops that we tag correctly, we tag one jet incorrectly. And this is actually pretty good, and uh, 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 improvements on this can uh, still be made, uh, but they're not uh, in this analysis uh, yet, but this is sort of the, the ballpark. And, uh, and uh, if you're a student, actually, uh, working on this is, uh, is actually, there are a lot of easy projects you can do here, especially if you're interested in things like uh, applying image processing technology to, uh, to uh, try to tag uh, boosted tops and so on. Right? It's, a very, it's a very fast moving but still kind of uh, a developing field. Uh, all right, so what are the good things about these, uh, these events? So I talked to KC about this uh, this morning, so now I can show you on the, on the slide what I meant. If you have low energy tops and decay, they decay isotropically into these six jets, all right? 
you will have a problem that all you see in detector, in your detector, is six jets. You don't know which, which one came out of which top. So you have to actually try really hard to attempt to match each one of these jets to a correct top, okay? So the combinatorics here are very, very troublesome. And this is, this is a very difficult problem. Instead, if the top flies out at very high energy and the decay products of the top come out collimated, okay, you're in a kinematic regime where things are naturally just well separated, okay? And you don't have any combinatorical issues. You see things that move in this direction come from this top, things that move in this direction come from that top, that's it, okay? This problem of combinatorics becomes completely trivial, all right? The second good thing is that if you look at um, essentially how the distribution of, of your background channels will scale, what you will find out is that, that typically they will, they will scale much faster than the possible, on average, uh, than the possible new physics. This is not a very model dependent uh, feature. The, this generically appears out of just kinematics of uh, decays of heavy particles. And what you also find out is that typically if you, if you have uh, resonances in, uh, in uh, multi-TE range, is that they will sit in the deep, deep, deep tails of the distributions of, uh, of your standard model backgrounds, okay? So this is very good because if you had a non-boosted top, okay, the distribution, these distributions would sit somewhere here, okay, in the bulk of the, of the backgrounds, all right? So you would have to deal with a lot more background to begin with. So here, if you just make a, a requirement that you want at least one uh, uh, top with the energy of uh, 500 GeV, you've essentially killed 90% of the backgrounds already, all right? So in a lot of ways, this uh, uh, high energy uh, frontier kinematic regime is, is, uh, is simpler to analyze than, uh, than uh, uh, the, the non-boosted one. Okay, so some people would say this is all nice and neat, but uh, you know, you're talking about jets and uh, top quarks and also decay into leptons. And here by leptons, I mean electrons and, and neons. And this is completely true. But uh, let's, let's see uh, uh, what the problem with the leptons is. And I'm gonna argue that uh, if you require too many leptons, this is not always a good thing, all right? So how do you get leptons in a, in a new physics scenario? So one, one way is to, you have some new particle that simply decays into a standard model electron or a muon. And if, if this is indeed the case, then uh, you have to look at leptons. There's, uh, there's nothing else you can do, okay? They decay to leptons, that's just the way the world works, all right? Now, alternatively, this heavy particle, like in the previous example which I showed you, it can decay into, uh, into some heavy mo uh, standard model states, like a top quark or a W boson or a Z boson and so on. If this is indeed the case, then to get an interesting lepton out of such event, there are only really two ways. One is decay of the W, which will give you a lepton and a neutrino, or a decay of a Z, which will give you a, a positive and negative lepton. All right? This, this is it. So you should think, uh, uh, when you think about this, just think about how the top decays into leptons. So it decays into a W and, sorry, a W and a B about 100% of the time, and then this W gives you the, the lepton and the neutrino. And this is the lepton that, that is interesting in this case. But if you want to have a lot of leptons in your events, this has a benefit in the sense that, that it's a very clean signal because you can reconstruct leptons very well but it comes at a price, and the price is the following. If you look at the probability that a W boson decays into a neutrino and a lepton, it's about 22% of the time, okay? If you look at the probability that a Z decays to a lepton, it's about 7% of the time. Conversely, the W will, will decay into jets, into quarks, about two-thirds out of the time, uh, while the Z will decay into uh, quarks about 70% of the time, and this is actually supposed to be a new bar, uh, but late back, uh, did something weird. Uh, Z decays into neutrinos about 20% of the time, okay? So if you want to, let's say, have two leptons out of a, out of a TT bar event in your, uh, in your uh, uh, sample, you're essentially multiplying your number of events that you produce by 22% squared, which is about 5%. So you're discarding 95% of your events, okay? And in a lot of cases, this is okay, but sometimes it, it might actually be hurtful, right? So where is it 
where is it hurtful? For that to to get to that, I wanna I wanna first define of uh, some criteria by which we uh, we will uh, measure success of of each uh, method. So let's say we want to discover this heavy resonance, all right? And I want to see under which conditions. I can discover it, and in which can I discover it with leptons or with jets? So I will say that, uh, that in order to, to discover this resonance, this is the condition that I need to meet. I need to have a statistical significance, okay, uh, some measure of statistical significance, which in this case I will take just to be the, the, the pure Poissonian uh, signal to root background greater than five, okay? And I will require at least 10 signal events. Okay. Now this is really, uh, in a way, this is really naive, but it allows me to, to establish some sort of scaling relations which will give you a feel of how, how things work. All right. This is not the, the full 95% you know, uh, confidence uh, uh, limit analysis, but it's, it's good enough for, for, uh, for illustration. All right. Now you can, you can argue whether you want 5, 10, or 100 events here, but uh, the, the gist of the point won't change. John, no questions? Okay. Um, okay, so let's see uh, what is the sort of estimate of the highest mass of this resonance that we can probe, all right? So I will use uh, uh, for the uh, cross-section, which tells me essentially uh, uh, the, the out, of, out of a fixed number of uh, amount of events, what fraction of events will be my signal events, okay? I will use the, the um, unit femtobarn here, and it's a unit of area, actually. Uh, but to give you a feel of, uh, of the scale, if you want to uh, scatter neutrons of uh, um, uranium nuclei, okay, you will get something like a cross-section of a barn. This is how it got its name, actually. Uh, the, in the standard model, if you want to produce two tops, that's about a nano barn. And the standard model Higgs uh, will be about 10 picobarns. So we're looking here at processes which are actually orders of magnitude sl smaller than, uh, than any of these standard model processes, all right? So, I want to satisfy this criterion that I get 10 events of the signal, all right? So how do I do that? Now, uh, I have the, the cross-section, which, which tells me some sort of a, a, a estimate of, of the, the or the, in a fixed amount of data, the probability that I will find the signal event. Now, I will not be able to select all of them because my detector is not perfect, so I will have to carve out some uh, parts of uh, uh, phase space where uh, if an electron flies out at a certain angle, I won't be able to cap capture it. The same thing is for jets and so on. So this, uh, this all goes into some efficiency of selection cuts. And I have to, to multiply this total production cross-section with the, the probability that it will decay into a, into a particle that I'm interested in. So this will be different from for electrons and uh, jets and uh, uh, neutrinos in the case of the Z and so on, all right? And then uh, uh, the total number of events that you will expect to see at a given cross-section is given by the product of these three quantities and the total amount of data that you collected which is called the integrated luminosity. This is the inverse femtobarn thing, all right? So I want this condition to be true. I want this to be 10, all right? So if I invert this equation, I find that the, the highest mass, essentially, order of magnitude that I can probe in any of the channels is given by, by a formula like this. And I'm going to assume that I already reproduce uh, S to root B greater than five, okay, for, for the moment. Now, what are the things that I can play with here? Okay, so the luminosity is set by, by the experiment. It's the total amount of data that I collected. If I want to collect more, I have to invest millions of dollars in years of work. All right, so I have to either be very rich and or wait for a long time. I don't want to do that, okay? This is fixed. Um, if you look at how the detectors are, are, are constructed and, and sort of the observables that we use, you find out that order of magnitude, a typical selection of interesting events Will, will actually discard about 90% of the events. You'll only, only end up with about 10%, right? And it's extremely difficult to, to, to improve on this. I, I've tried many times, but no matter what I do, at the end of the day, I end up with a number like this. Okay, 10 to 20, if you get 20%, you're, you're in very good shape. Um, so the only thing I can play with 
is essentially the choice of the, of the uh, final state, whether I want jets or electrons and so on, all right? Now what this tells me is because the, the probability of these interesting physics objects that decay to leptons is typically much smaller than to decay to jets, what it tells me is that at least at low luminosity, leptons will have a limited mass reach, okay? So this is, the, this is uh, one of the main points. Leptons are good, but they're limited by the fact that you, you, uh, they don't appear often enough, okay? Now, here's a concrete example of what I, what I mean. So this is a study that we did um, recently where we considered a very generic search for what are called the fermionic top partners of charge two-thirds, okay? Uh, so these uh, appear in a wide class of composite Higgs models, but this is uh, not very important. The point is that uh, something like this is possible, all right? And people want to look for it, so I want to see how I can improve on, on, on what people are doing. So the way you produce these typically is uh, uh, this quark comes out of one proton, this gluon comes one out of the other proton, uh, this gluon splits into a BB bar pair, let's say, this quark emits a, a W, here you produce this heavy particle, okay, which is about the mass of uh, TV or larger, and that this particle decays into a top quark, which is very high energy because this is a TV particle, and a Z boson, which is also a very high energy. Okay? So these two things, when they decay, they come out very collimated. All right? Now, the question I, I asked myself at the time was, what will work better here? If this Z decays into two leptons or if it decays into two neutrinos? So, KC, what will work better? No, uh, I thought you did the wrong example. <laughs> 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 no, but uh, if you have, uh, I, no, I know. You don't require leptons uh, for the Z decay. As you said, present proton is too small. Yeah, but, but people do. No, I, I understand that's a wonder. So yeah. in this case, yes, you're right. You, 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 your bet is on neutrinos here. No, 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 the, the, your example is great, but uh, I'm trying to say that you don't require to have the leptons from the Z decay because present proton is too small. But there are leptons Sure. Present, present, yeah, but that, I, I mentioned that earlier. In this case, in this, I'm so not touching. Is this example is yeah. Great for your case. Yeah, yeah, but the, of course it is. I <laughs> came up with it. <laughs> yeah, but once, once you go through your main channel, which is not going to be those leptons, you can always come back and you know for sure what you need to Ah, exactly. No, no. So you, you're saying you're saying that at the end of the day you want to do both. Yeah. Yeah. Fair enough. And you okay. got to, you got to see a pair of leptons with a Z mass. Confirm this channel. Yeah, 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 yeah. Fine, fine, fine. Not, not right away. Yeah, the point, the point is that, that I'm at the end of this year, I'm going to get 10 inverse femtobarns of data. Okay? I want to do physics I in the meantime. You're not going to get any data. <laughs> no, I mean, I mean uh, 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 you know, uh, 10, 10 inverse femtobarns of data will be uh, somewhere in the cosm of particle physics. Okay? And I, wanna, I don't want to wait until they collect more data so I can do, do leptons. I want to do things right away. So I want to do the thing that will give me the maximum amount of information with the minimum amount of data that I have. Fair enough? So yeah. I guess you will explain the jet final are better in this case, probably it is really better, but is TZ better than the ZZ? Um, yes, it turns out because uh, the background for WB is so much larger that, that you, you really need to try. First, there are two things. To, uh, that plot that I showed you that, that at 50% B tagging efficiency you only end up with a 1% fake rate of light jets, that's much worse for a W. A, w, a, a boosted W jet is much more similar to a, to a light quark or gluon. It looks like, it, remember it decays into two things, so you have only two prongs. No, if I have a W and B, it's probably by a lepton. Ah, okay, you, so you want to be in a lepton. Yeah, but W plus W plus jets will kill you there. Ah, yes, 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 yes. Very good, very good. P and Z in your this model, is T Z present person larger than W Z present person? in this particular example, yes. But we also checked we also checked for W B and uh, as far as I remember, uh, the backgrounds were this it sorta of worked, but this worked better. Where is the TH? Uh, yeah, you can have TH as well. So that's that's a study we're doing right now. Okay. Yeah, this was just uh, one example. Yeah. 
we're, we're actually doing a study in which we, uh, we consider all three. As a, as, so the branching ratios are three parameters. So I can show you a preliminary plot like of this data. Combining with three, what's the left one from the three different standards? We have, we have, I, can, I can show you we have exactly this, but uh, it's not ready to be uh, put out uh, in public yet. This is just the, this was the first quick paper that we wanted to write on, uh, on the topic, just to point out that, uh, you know, uh, the, way, the way things looked at ATV and things that were uh, sort of deemed the best channels at uh, ATV are not necessarily the best things at, at Plotting TV. So what we did was we tried a couple of things. So we set the mass uh, of this uh, T prime resonance to one TV, and this is essentially what set the kinematic regime of our events. And then we compared the, the uh, reach of, uh, of uh, uh, the channel where Z goes to neutrinos to the channel where Z goes to leptons, where in order to be sort of model independent, we left the, the production cross-section a free parameter, okay? And then we plotted the, the S to root B, the signal significance and the number of events and so on, uh, as a function of, uh, of integrated luminosity, meaning the amount of data. Okay, so remember I defined the discovery region as S to root B greater than five and N events greater than 10. So then, then the region of the space which can be discovered in, in uh, Z to leptons is something like this, this shaded region here, and about the same region can be discovered in Z to neutrinos. So at, at one TV, actually, both of these channels uh, 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 perform uh, comparatively. But if you go to a higher mass, 1.5 TV or so on, then the fact that you're requiring leptons starts hurting you a lot. So the only region that you can discover is this little patch here, which would require you to have a, a much larger luminosity, about, uh, about twice the amount of luminosity as, as what you would need to discover this, this uh, little point that described by the star here if you looked at the neutrinos, all right? So that's, that's the point, that, that at run two, the things that we thought were the most sensitive to new physics for run one are actually not the most sensitive anymore. So this is just one example, all right? Which brings me to point number four, which is that no matter where I look, I keep noticing that, that really the most sensitive final states for, for uh, heavy new physics searches at run two are always jet plus something. So jet plus missing energy, jet plus lepton, it's never really multi-leptons or, or things like that. There's always a, a, a jet, and it's got to do with the fact that the probability that uh, tops and so on will decay to jets is much larger. So when you're in this regime where you're limited by the fact that you have only a few events, you really can't afford to cut out any of the signal. Right? So here's another good example. It's a very similar diagram, but in this case, I'm going to produce a very, very exotic object. Okay, and this object will have charge five thirds. All right, we've never seen anything like this. Okay, in, in particle physics, if we see this, this would be fantastic. People look for it, and 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 there it is. Now, in this case, because of charge conservation, um, this is also a top partner, so it has to cut to to decay to couple to the top quark. And then the only other thing that it can really uh, uh, decay into is a W uh, a quark uh, because of charge conservation. And what's really special about this kind of uh, uh, event is that the charge, the sign of the charge of this top and the sign of the charge of this W is going to be the same. They're all gonna be positive if this is uh, five thirds, plus five thirds, okay? Now what does this mean? When you decay this top uh, consequently, you're gonna get a positive lepton here and you're gonna get a positive lepton here. Okay, so you have two positive leptons in your event. And this is very special because if you look in the standard model, it's very difficult to produce an event which will give you two positive, only two positive leptons. This is extremely rare. Okay, the, the cross-section for these kind of processes are very small. As a matter of fact, a lot of, the, a lot of the times when you see an event like this and it comes from the standard model, is because of detector effects. It's because your detector measured something that was not a lepton as a lepton. Okay, so this is a very, very, very good signal of, uh, of uh, some new physics, in particular, in this case, this, uh, this uh, five-thirds charged object. It appears in all kinds of new physics scenarios. You can find this in supersymmetry as well, and, and so on and so on. 
Okay? A lot of people will call this the golden channel for uh, this kind of music. But the problem is, again, that if you require two leptons, what you end up is that the number of events that you should expect, uh, let's say that your, your, uh, your production cross-section is 20 femtobar, okay? Then the number of events that you should expect after about a year and a half or two of LHC <laughs> running, which will give you 35 immerse femtobars, is essentially limited by the fact that you have two, two probabilities that W will decay to uh, a lepton, which is 0.22 squared. This gives you about three events. Okay, so you cannot discover, according to my criteria, you cannot discover this cross section at the LHC with 35 inverse femtobars. It's out of the reach. All right, you will need at least three times the, the, the amount of data to get to the necessary 10 events. All right, now, if instead you take the top, for instance, to decay into three quarks and, and form this boosted jet and take the W to decay into a lepton and a neutrino, okay? You can do this, you can add the combination of W to jet and this to neutrino as well, but for the purpose of example, it's uh, unnecessary. You go to the same exercise. Here, you have one probability that a W will decay to a neutrino and one uh, probability it will decay into, uh, into quarks, which is 0.22 times 2 thirds. You actually get to 10 events, all right? Now, all you have to make sure is that your signal, the, your background is low enough that you end up with high enough signal significance. And so we produce this plot. Here's 35 inverse femtobarns. Here's 20 femtobarn of a production cross section. You actually end up with S to root B, which is 12. So this point, which you cannot reach at the early age LHC with same sign dial leptons, you can discover with jets uh, and leptons in another channel, okay? Yes. So it's it's a great idea to put the production cross section as a free variable and then get rid of all these things. Mm -hmm. But how much of these plots that we've been looking at that you published uh, involve cross sections that are actually feasible? Ah no no. So so yeah yeah uh, absolutely. We checked. Okay. So if you wanna if you wanna talk about a you are plotting cross sections that are in a region of. Yeah. Couplings of order one. Exactly. So, so we, we take, it. in this case, uh, for all these studies, what we were taking was, uh, that's a good question. I mean, we don't want to, of course, I can always come up with a cross section that will be high enough to give me the answer that I want, right? That's your point. Uh, so what we did for these studies was, uh, because these kind of objects, these, uh, these uh, five-thirds charge objects, appear fairly generically in composite Higgs-type models. Um, what we did was we took a simplified uh, composite Higgs model, which has some uh, free parameters of couplings and so on, okay? And we made sure that these couplings were actually uh, not only of order one, but also meet some uh, 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 bounds from uh, other physics to convince the community that what we're doing is not crazy, okay? And so, so everything, everything that I'm telling you here is uh, is assuming some sort of reasonable parameters for couplings that are, you know, uh, uh, right-handed couplings of order one, uh, phases of order one, uh, things like this. Nothing here is running out of the perturbative range or, uh, uh, you know, horrifically violating uh, the S parameter or any of the other, five minutes, perfect, I'm almost done. Um, now, I'll, I'll here, I'll mention uh, one other uh, work uh, by uh, uh, Mike Spanowski and Alex Azatov uh, and uh, friends. So uh, I'm not the only one who noticed this, okay? And uh, given that, that these kind of things kind of fall under the radar, this is, this is exactly the reason why I wanted to talk about this kind of thing. But th there's a very interesting study, for instance, that they did, uh, these people did for, for in, a, in a context of a particular composite, simplified composite Higgs model. But the point here was that they found out that even if you looked at the 8 TV CMS analysis, which was done with same sign dial leptons, and you looked at the, in their model, uh, essentially the, the exclusion, okay, of the same sign dial leptons, they found out that if instead you looked at the boosted jet plus lepton channel, which is what I had on the previous slide, your exclusion bound would have been significantly better. So even, even at 8 TV, this went unnoticed. People could have done better. 
right? And at 14 TV, this is certainly going to be the case, right? Okay, so a few very quick uh, uh, conclusions. Uh, the main one is, from what I see, many places I, I actually look, conventional wisdom of, on, on how we should look for new physics actually fails. Mm -hmm. All right. And to me, this is a great opportunity to write uh, a lot of quick papers, uh, you know, introducing new search strategies and so on. Uh, it seems that, that, that really the lepton plus jet final states uh, are, are sort of, on average, really coming out to be the, the, the most sensitive channels in a lot of these searches for new physics. And so I expect that in the future, what we'll see, hopefully, is a lot more of this kind of uh, analysis. And it's really, the LHC is gearing up, so this is a perfect time to actually uh, sort of fix these things, to uh, reevaluate the search strategies, come up with new things to, uh, to, to new observables, new ways to, uh, to uh, measure new physics, new uh, proposed new final states, and so on. And I will conclude with this very optimistic cliche uh, note that we should really hope that uh, LHC discovers something uh, new and exciting. But we'll see. Uh, yeah, so I, I yeah, yeah, so I, I, uh, I have a couple of Atlas people who were interested, exchange emails and uh, and uh, you know manuscripts, but they haven't uh, contacted us back yet. Uh, so I don't know. But uh, when I when I talk to experimentalists, uh, they, they they seem interested. So I I mean. I really want to, I, I need to, what I need to do is I need to find an experimentalist who has a student who has time, okay, to actually do this. And then then, uh, then things can get going. But, uh, yes? So, uh, I'd like to add an experimentalist I'm kind of interested. We're actually doing something very similar. Excellent. To this, this week, uh, Teddy Hart. Okay. But you spent a lot of time explaining why leptons are going to be using your, your signal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, so the problem with the all hadronic for 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 a theorist is basically if if you have a fully hadronic channel, then your main background is the multi jets. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now the problem with the multi jets is that that I don't know what the cross section for the multi jets is. I don't know how to calculate it. I don't know how to estimate it. You know how to estimate it because you extrapolate it from data, right? And until you have data and you tell me what this number is, I can only give you some very poor estimate of, uh, of, of what this is. Given for a phenomenology paper, I can probably come up with something of order of magnitude that's gonna be okay. But uh, in a lot of cases, uh, it's just simpler to require one lepton. And then you don't really have to worry about the, the multi-jets. But I have, I have a paper also in which we looked at, uh, for instance, in these composite Higgs models, you can have light quark pa partners, and these can decay to light quarks and Higgses. Okay, so here we have uh, two boosted Higgses and two light jets, and and we we showed that this indeed works. Okay, order of magnitude uh, uh, type of thing, but you you can come up with the actual examples in TT bar resonance searches where the fully hadronic TT bar resonance search at ATV worked better than fully leptonic. At the end of the day, I think lepton plus jet worked still the best because you really eliminate the, the multi-jet background. But uh, but even there, the lep the fully leptonic was not the, was not the best thing to do. But, but earlier you were showing that plot. I don't know if you can go back to the one where you were showing about how the background falls off. Mm -hmm. the yeah, I, it's not really accurate. I just kind of added a line uh, for illustration. <laughs> so don't don't uh, yeah don't don't read this number. Uh, uh, yeah, seriously. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm curious, like, what background you're considering in that. So, so in this case, uh, I, so for this particular study, I believe that what we did was uh, uh, one top goes leptonic, one goes hadronic, uh, and uh, so this was the the PT of the of the hadronic top reconstructed, and then the main background here would be W plus jets. So this is this is the jet. From the W plus jets. Okay. Uh, yeah. P, uh, you're, so, 
it depends on, on uh, it depends on which uh, mass you're probing. So if if you look at the lower masses, something like a uh, one TV, there TT bar. You're right. TT bar there is the largest background, but W plus jets has this extremely long tail. Okay, so if you move your HT to even higher uh, 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 sort of energy scales, what you'll find out is that you're picking less of the tail of TT bar and more of the tail of W plus jets. Yeah. So it Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so so it's 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 kind of a, a balance between cutting off, cutting out enough background and gaining enough signal. But my point was that even before you actually s start thinking about how much background you cut, you've already cut too much signal in in that leptons. That's that's the point. Yeah. So uh, or think of it this way: the amount of if if you have a very heavy particle, so the cross section is very small, and you have fixed luminosity. The amount of background you are allowed to cut is determined about, uh, by how much of the signal cross section you can cut out. Okay, that's that's the main point. Uh, yeah, in addition to uh, heavy unstable particles, we have dark matter which is stable and we don't know what it is. So uh, the strategy with uh, one, just one jet and missing mm -hmm. energy on the other one is it the best strategy to? Uh, so so there it's, uh, I mean. Unless you look at the the top, with like uh, top plus missing energy or something like that, I mean, one jet plus met is really like this is this is simple enough that that it's likely that you can't really do much more. But it's the problem is there. I I can't. It's hard for me to answer this question because it's kind of model dependent. It, because it depends on on how dark matter couples to to a standard model. If it's only top philic, then I don't know uh, if uh, if uh, met plus top or met plus jet will work better. Or, um, yeah, it's it's difficult to say. It, it's clear it's clear that you don't have a clear comparison like uh, like you have here, where oops, it's not as clear as uh, uh, yeah. Like yeah, in this case, we're really changing are. the. Yeah, yeah I, but, but if, you're, if you're asking me a question like, let's say that you were looking at uh, MET plus, plus Z, okay, and there whether, whether leptons or neutrinos will work better, um, it's actually a good question because there your MET is coming from dark matter and neutrinos. So it's likely that uh, it, it could be that uh, the, the MET actually gets smeared up so much that you, you don't get this uh, nice effect. From, uh, from, from from increasing the branching ratio. But also also the, the sensitivity of LHC to dark matter searches is typically in the low mass regime. Uh, so, so so I think yeah, I think that, that in this case in this case none of this boosted technology would help you in any it's in any way. So it, but it's there. Yeah, if it's if it's large mass scale, then then a lot of this will still work. Yeah, but if it's uh, if everything is light, which is where the bonds of the LHC are, are doing the best, then then I, I don't think this kind of stuff would uh, would apply. So you you say that uh, you, you you have used uh, imagine techniques for identifying the jets within the for highly boosted uh, yeah. objects. So can you tell us more about that? Uh, so, so what, what is, what this uh, this might be. I mean, I can tell you, uh, I can talk your ear to oblivion about this. So it's better if you ask me a more specific question. Well, you're interested. I, you know, like, uh, what do you mean exactly by imaging uh, techniques? For ah. example, in uh, yeah, I have worked in something similar in the past uh, by analyzing Dali's plots decays. Okay. Know, for, in in Dali's plots uh, and applying I I imaging techniques for effects. So okay. I, I was wondering what kind of yeah. what exactly what so is the basic. Uh, so one way, one way to do it, and I'll tell you, uh, John and I worked on, uh, on this, and this is not published yet, so, but <laughs> I, I'll, I'll tell you what the idea is. <laughs> we have to get all our unpublished stuff together. <laughs> yeah, 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 we, we really do. This is why I'm here. Um, so one thing to do is, uh, uh, and, and this is new, and it's not very well established yet, okay? But it's one thing to do. So what you can, what can, you can say is this is an image. 
Okay, each, each uh, energy deposition within the synergy is a pixel, okay? And what I can do is I can essentially expand this image in, in, some, uh, in some 2D basis, okay? So this can be Fourier transform, it can be wavelets. Uh, people actually, actually tried wavelets with varying success, okay? Uh, John and I tried to use a singular value decomposition, okay? You can actually, this I did and this works spectacularly well. You can actually feed this picture, just the image, nothing else, into a neural net. You can train the neural net to recognize these patterns and then, then uh, train the weights of the neural net according to, to what you see here. And then, and then you just feed a jet into the neural net. It comes out with an output which tells you, is this a top or a light quark? It works, actually I can show you, it works spectacularly well. But it's kind of a black box. So it, 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 we're still working on ex essentially understanding exactly what it's doing. Yeah. Uh, so one thing, another thing was what I was saying was to uh, expand this into a certain basis. Then you look at moments uh, uh, in this basis and you hope that, that particular moments in this basis will tell you some information about the dynamics that happen here. Okay, that's one thing. Another thing is that uh, this is sort of inspired by, by image uh, processing uh, it's called n sub jettiness. Mm -hmm. So what you can look at is you can try to divide the space of this picture into two regions, three regions, four regions, and so on, okay? And you can come up with some sort of a measure of how well does this splitting into n regions fit this picture, mm -hmm. all right? And then what, it, what you do is you take ratios of how well does this fit a three region uh, uh, configuration versus two, two versus one, and so on and so on. And that way, you can say that if this fits a three region configuration very well, this is a very good top quark. If, if it fits two re uh, region configuration very well, then this is uh, something like a light jet and so on and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, another method that I worked a lot on, uh, what it does is actually, um, it, it probes different points in, in this uh, in this space, okay? And at each point, it actually says, okay, I wanna put a quark here, a here, and here, okay? Then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna see uh, uh, whether I'm, I'm getting any energy depositions uh, in these three quarks that I, that I place there, okay? And, and each one of these quark also varies in, in the amount of energy that it carries, okay? If I see that the energy that I assign to, quark, to, to each quark is actually far away from what I see in the detector, mm -hmm. then, then I discard this configuration. And I do this until I get something that fits, okay? The very good thing about this, uh, this method is that it really uh, has a very intuitive parton level picture of the top decay. And you can build all these kinematics of the top, like the fact that two of them need to sum up to a W and so on, trivial easily into the, into the method. Okay, and you can do this for tops, Ws, Higgses, whatever, okay? And, and uh, it's called the template overlap method, mm -hmm. okay? So at the end of the day, if you, if, you have, if you require that you have three quarks and you find a configuration that fits very well, okay? Then you, it's very likely that, the, that this energy distribution really corresponds to a top quark, mm -hmm. okay? If it doesn't, then it's something else, light jet, uh, Higgs, or... Uh, but there, yeah, there's a, I mean, just, just here, look, this, uh, these are some of the method. This is not even half of, of what people are doing. Yeah. So. Questions? Let's take our speaker. <laughs> this is not gonna go on YouTube, right? Yeah. <laughs> 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 Good to see you too.